Chapter Two, Part Two of Chronicles of Crime and Criminals, Number One, by Beaver Publishing Company. Full and authentic account of the Whitechapel murders, Part Two. Whilst London was ringing with the news, the terror which already existed was heightened by the intelligence of a crime which was equally barbarous and almost equally inexplicable. The unfortunate sufferers, by the first outrage, were buried in the presence of a large number of people on the Sunday following, and on the Thursday after, the twelfth night from their death. The entire household of Williamson's, with one exception, was slaughtered, as already stated. On that night between eleven and twelve, the passers-by in New Gravel Lane were alarmed by a cry of murder, which came from a man clothed in nothing but his shirt who was hanging by the sheets of his bed, which he had knotted together, from a second-floor window at number 81 in that thoroughfare. He contrived to reach the ground, and then told those who had hurried upon hearing his cry of murder that murderers were in the house, slaughtering everyone within. A couple of men thereupon burst open the door, when they found the mistress and maid-servant lying by the kitchen fire with their throats cut from ear to ear. In the cellar was the master of the house also, with his head nearly severed from his body, and one of his legs broken. The grandchild of the murdered man, a little girl, was happily found alive, but there were evidences that the murderer had entered the room, doubtless with the intention of slaying it also, for he was eventually shown pretty clearly to have been the Mar murderer and no doubt his fiendish instincts were equally strong on each occasion. The noise of the breaking door and the persons entering the house, however, prevented his carrying his diabolical purpose into effect. Rushing upstairs, the crowd found the door of a room locked. As they burst it open, they heard the crash of glass. The murderer had sprung through the window, and in the fog which prevailed was lost to sight. Then the man in the shirt found an opportunity to speak. It appeared that he was a lodger in the house and had gone to bed, but was awoke by a cry of, We shall be murdered! Out of bed he sprang, and looking over the stairs, saw through the window of the taproom a powerful, well-made man, six feet high, dressed in drab, shaggy bearskin coat, stooping over the body of Mrs. Williamson, rifling her pockets. Then upon his terrified ears came the sounds of the sighs of a person in the agonies of death. Frightened half out of his life, he ran to the top of the house, but could not find the trap-door whereby to escape. Then he crept back to his room and escaped, as stated, through the window. Rewards were now offered amounting to fifteen hundred pounds, and a great number of persons were taken up on suspicion. Amongst them was a John Williams, or Murphy, for he went by either name, an Irish sailor, lodging at the Pear Tree public house not far off. The wallet which had been left behind was marked with the initials J.P., and a wallet so marked was missing from a tool chest which had been felt at the Pear Tree by John Peterson, a ship's carpenter. Mr. Vermeely, the landlord, who was at the time of the murderers in Newgate for debt, was shown the wallet, Murphy's washerwoman stated that there was blood on a shirt and some on stockings he had sent to her. More than one person had seen him near Williamson's house on the night of the murder, and others proved that he was well acquainted with both Marr and Williamson. Then, with that fatal stupidity that so often characterizes the guilty, Murphy, when told on Friday morning of the murder, and being yet in bed, replied surly, I know it. In his dreams, too, he had muttered words sufficient to implicate him, and so he was apprehended on the same day and committed for trial on the Saturday, a strong escort being provided to guard him on his way to Cold Bath Fields Prison. Nor was the caution ill-judged. All along the route he was attended by a howling, roaring mob, anxious to tear him limb from limb and hurl his quivering flesh to the four winds. Escort and prisoner were only too thankful to get safely to the prison. Murphy managed, however, to cheat the hangman, and two days after Christmas his lifeless body was discovered hanging by his handkerchief from the iron grating of his cell. In accordance with the barbarous custom of the period, 
The suicide was buried in the dead of night at four crossroads, with a stake driven through his body. Not many months ago, Misters Aird and Lucas, workmen, digging a trench for the purpose of laying a main for the commercial gas company at a point where the Cannon Street Road and Cable Street in St. George's in the East intersect one another, discovered a skeleton, supposed to be that of Murphy, with a stake driven through it, and some portions of a chain were lying close to the bones. The death of Murphy did not do much toward allaying the public panic. A general notion prevailed that he had been assisted by accomplices, and two of his friends named Albras and Hart were apprehended. But after several examinations, they were discharged. The excitement took a long time to subside, but eventually the occurrences faded out of recollection, and now, with the exception of the journals of the period, there's nothing to keep alive their memory but the innocent door chain, with which not one in a hundred of the modern jerry-built villas is furnished. Such is the yarn that old people in London tell young people of famous murders in Whitechapel. Meanwhile, though the old mystery was solved, the new is as deep and dire an enigma as ever. Dorset Street is one of the narrowest, dirtiest little alleys of all those that go to make up the labyrinth known as the East End of London. To get there, a cabman had to ask questions, a rare thing, while his passengers on the journey loses all idea of location, and wonders whether the cab's horse's head or tail is pointing toward the north. Until today, only a few out of many million landowners knew that Dorset Street in the East End existed, but they know it now, and will, with all other Englishmen, talk about it for weeks. On the day of the Lord Mayor's show, November 9th, all interest was taken from that senseless pageant by ragged boys struggling through the crowds with bundles of newspapers and yelling that another horrible Whitechapel murder had occurred in Dorset Street. You have read about these Whitechapel murders, and you know how the cutting up of some wretched woman is a happening which the average Britisher has come to look for as one of the regular incidents of metropolitan life. It has got to such a point that those murders can almost be written up after the methodical fashion which characterizes the minutes of some school board meeting. Each time a miserable creature belonging to the most degraded class of women is mutilated in a most inconceivably horrible fashion, the murderer has disappeared. The police do nothing but observe secrecy. The general public theorizes as to whether the murderer is mad or sane, short or tall, English or foreign, etc. The Whitechapel women shiver in bunches, wondering whose turn will come next, and after a while the terror in the East End and the curiosity in the West End subside together until a fresh murder renews them. The last and ninth Whitechapel murder was not committed in Dorset Street, properly speaking. Out of Dorset Street there opens an arched passage, low and narrow. A big man walking through it would bend his head and turn sideways to keep his shoulders from rubbing against the dirty bricks. At the end of the passage is a high court, not ten feet broad and thirty long, thickly whitewashed all round, for sanitary reasons, to a height of ten feet. That is Miller Court. Misery is written all over the place. The worst kind of London misery, such as those who have lived their lives in America can have no idea of. The first door at the end, on the right of the passage, opens into a tiny damp room on level with the pavement. The landlord of this and neighboring rooms is a John McCarthy, who keeps a little shop on Dorset Street on the side of the passage. About a year ago, he rented it to a woman who looked about thirty. She was popular among the females of the neighborhood, who shared her beer generously, as I've been tearfully informed, and went under the title of Mary Jane McCarthy. Her landlord knew that she had another name, Kelly, but her friends had not heard of it. It seems there had been a Mr. Kelly, whom Mary Jane had married in the manner which is considered satisfactory in Whitechapel. They had not gone to the expense of a license, but published the fact of matrimony by living in one small room and sharing joy and sorrow and drunkenness there together. 
Mary Jane took up her residence in the little room in Miller Court when Kelly went away. Since then her life had been that of all the women around her, her drunkenness and the number of strange men she brought to her little room being the gauges by which her sisters in wretchedness measured her prosperity. On November 8th she went out as usual, and was seen at various times up to half-past eleven drinking at various low-beer shops in Commercial Street. In those resorts she was known not as Mary Jane, her own name, but as Fair Emma, a title bestowed in complimentary allusion to her appearance. At last, just before midnight, she went home with some man who appeared to have dissuaded her from making a good-night visit, as was her custom, at the drinking place nearest her room. No description whatever can be obtained of this man. Right opposite the passage leading to Mary Jane's room is a big and very pretentious lodging house, where the charge is four pence. Some gentlemen congregated about the door at midnight are sure they saw a man and a woman, the latter being Mary Jane, stop to laugh at a poster on one side of the passage, which offers a hundred pound reward for the Whitechapel murderer. The man must have enjoyed the joke, for he himself was the Whitechapel murderer beyond all doubt. This picture from real life of a murderer reading an advertised reward for his capture with the woman he is about to butcher is not a usual one. A great deal of speculation will be done as to whether he was a cold-blooded monster trembling at his own danger as he read, or a madman, defiant of everything and with difficulty restraining his impulse to kill at once. The men who saw him can only say that he did not look remarkable. At ten o'clock in the morning, just as the Lord Mayor was climbing into his golden carriage, three horrified policemen, who had first looked in through Mary Jane's window and then drunk big glasses of brandy to steady themselves, were breaking in her door with a pickaxe. The Whitechapel murderer had done his work with more horrible thorness than ever before. The miserable woman's body was literally scattered all over her little room. A description of such butchery is unpleasant to write, but it is necessary to understand London's state of terror and to form an opinion as to this remarkable murder. Almost every conceivable mutilation has been practiced on the body. McCarthy, the shopkeeper and landlord, had seen the body first. He had gone, as he had daily for a long time past, to ask for several weeks' arrears of rent, amounting in all to thirty shillings. Though not an imaginative man, McCarthy at once expressed the conviction that a devil, and not a man, had been at work. This, by the way, is a new theory in regard to the murderer's identity. The woman's nose was cut off, and her face gashed. She had been completely disemboweled, as had all the murderer's former victims, and all the intestines had been placed upon a little table which, with a chair and the bed, constituted all the furniture in the room. Both the woman's breasts had been removed and placed also on the table. Large portions of the thighs had been cut away, and the head was almost completely severed from the body. One leg was almost completely cut off. The mutilation was so frightful that more than an hour was spent by the doctors in endeavoring to reconstruct the woman's body from the pieces so as to place it in a coffin and have it photographed. On the 8th of November, at midnight, Dorset Street and all the neighborhood was swarming with such a degraded Whitechapel throng as have already been described in these columns. Those with any money were getting drunk very fast. The drunkenness of the poor of London is amazing. Many sober women, and all the drunken ones, were crying from terror, while the men lounged about, singing or fighting, and chafing the women, according to their ideas of humor. Gallantry is not rampant among these Whitechapel men. The police were doing nothing of importance. The woman's poor fragments, put together as skillfully as possible, were lying in the Hound's Ditch mortuary, in a scratched and dirty shell of a coffin often used before. The mortuary is in a graveyard back of the gloomy old Hound's Ditch church, and not a pleasant spot late at night. While the body was being carried from the scene of the murder, 
thousands crowded as near as the police would allow, and gazed with lifted caps and pitying faces at the latest victim. The police did nothing but push the crowd about and be officious, this to such an extent that even those whose duty led them to the place found it necessary to place frequent softening half-crowns in policemen's palms. The most interesting individual in Miller Court was a woman who had known the dead woman, Mary Jane's pal, she called herself. Her room was directly opposite the murdered woman's, and its agitated proprietor stood in the doorway, urging a young girl with straggling wisps of red hair, who had started for beer, not to be gone a minute. She assured a reporter that she would be glad to talk to him while Kate was away, just to forget the horrors. This woman spoke well of the dead. Her name was Mary. She had not always been on peaceable terms with the murdered Mary Jane. Though quarrelsome, Mary Jane was pretty before she was cut up, she said. And she was only twenty-four, not thirty, as she looked. But she would fight, and did not care what sort of place she lived in. Mary's was about as big as a horse car. Sleeping and cooking were both done in it. On a clothesline stretched across it, a nightdress was drying. There was a bed one foot above the floor, a stool and a nondescript piece of furniture to hold things. There was milk in a saucer on the floor, showing that vile air and worse drainage had brought the kitten down without the help of hunger. When the girl with the red hair came back, the woman who had been a friend of Mary Jane drank in a few minutes a quart of beer, relating at the same time many incidents in the lives of herself and her dead friend. At last, with a flood of drunken tears, she declared that she would never dare go out on the streets again to earn a living, observed somewhat inconsistently that lightning never struck twice in the same place, meaning that the murderer would never come back to Miller Court, made the red-haired girl swear an oath to stay all night, and went to sleep on the bed with her head the wrong way up. Those who think they have a working plan for reforming society should take a careful look through Whitechapel and see the things they have got to reform. The girl with the red hair did not think it wonderful that no one had heard any sound of the murder. Someone was always drunk and yelling in Miller Court, and she rightly guessed that a woman being beaten would make as much noise as one cut up so that the murder would not be noticed. For her part, she was sure to imagine murder in every direction now. She had a strong mind, however, had not had any beer, and did not cry. She knew positively that Mary Jane was alive at one o'clock, and for that hour she had heard her singing Sweet Violets to whoever was in her room. This fact and the name of the tune has been solemnly entered in the police account of the case. It is useless to theorize any further concerning the murderer. He proved himself a man of wonderfully cool nerve or most utter recklessness. There is little prospect of anything resulting from the English detective's efforts. London has resigned itself to wait till the murderer shall betray himself. The question faces us. Who was the man who committed these harrowing murders? Many explanations have been given. A suicidal maniac, says one. A crank afflicted with insane desire for notoriety, says another. A man who has been injured in some mysterious way by a woman of the unfortunate class and who thus wreaks his vengeance. One of the most palpable explanations given as to the identity of the murderer was that advanced by John Paul Bocock in the New York world, ascribing the murders to Nicholas Vasily, a Russian, who committed a series of murders in Paris some years ago, and who, according to the journalist, now repeats his fell work in London. Here is the story of Vasily's crimes. Even if he should not prove to be the Whitechapel murderer, the story is interesting. No stronger story of love, crime, fanaticism, and mania has ever been told. The ferocious stamp of a savage realism marks the history of Nicholas Vasily, from the first as that of a man unfettered from human restriction, a law, a creed, a passion unto himself. He was born in 1847 at Tiraspol in the province of Cherson, 
At that time, a religious reform was just beginning to stir from the time-worn ruts of their creed, the peasantry and middle classes of southern Russia. Nicholas grew up to feel its influence to the depth of his strange nature. He grew up to be a tall, stern youth, broad shoulders, strong beyond the common power of his peers, dark-eyed, pale-faced. His family were well-to-do. He did not have to work, but studied, pondered, and came before his majority an ascetic in body as in mind. At the beginning of the year 1872, the Russian church made a vigorous effort to repress the spread of this fanatical asceticism in Cherson, of which Vasily was now a leading exponent, and which seemed to be running havoc among the peasantry and middle classes. The sect of which he was the rising apostle was that of the Shorn. When the Russian patriarchs began to persecute them, some of the Shorn were for a resort to arms. Others went into voluntary exile, and among the latter was Nicholas Vasily. He was now twenty-five years of age, and a notable-looking man in any assemblage. He had been well educated at Tiraspol and at the university at Odessa, and he had inherited from his parents an income sufficient to his own frugal needs. So fierce had been his denunciations of the oppressors of the Shorn, so vindictive his ascetism, that he had already come to be recognized as the young leader of this peculiar sect of the proscribed. Through him was crystallized and commanded for rigid discipline and observance of the main dogma, the cardinal principle of the creed of the Shorn, which was the total abnegation of all fleshy, especially sexual, pleasures. To this creed he deemed it his duty to convert the world. He gladly went into banishment, since it gave him the opportunity to make proselytes. The strength of his zeal had eaten up his human affiliations. He was no longer able to agree with even his fellow sectmen. He went to Paris and made himself known through letters of introduction to several members of the Russian colony there. He did not desire new friends among them but the opportunity through them of becoming acquainted with the city, with the people, and with the cocottes. He had already devoted himself to the salvation of Lys Amperde. He was now Der Selenwetter. In a month or two, his new Russian friend saw him no more. He could now find his way about alone. He took bachelor lodgings in Rue Mufstarde. Here his tall, lean, brawny form, his pale, waxy face, his burning black eyes soon attracted attention. He got to be known as an enigma. Amid piles of books he worked away all day, and when night came went out into the streets to wander about until dawn. His new mission was big within him, but he had not yet revealed it. Often his concierge would find him in the morning bent over his study table, where she had left him the evening before. By and by, people begin to talk of the Savior of the Lost Souls. He would be seen in the bright light of a cafe entrance, beneath the street lamps in the slums, at the edge of a dim cul-de-sac, wherever the Nifs de Pava congregated or could be found by painstaking search, pleading with them, weeping over them, extorting them to repent, lead a new life, save their souls, and join the sect of the Shorn. From entreaty he passed on to malediction, and he would, in strange burning words and with uncouth gestures, draw pictures of the perdition to which they were hastening, and from which he begged them to permit him to save them. Where they showed a sincere interest in his words, and promised to try to reform, he gave them money from his own purse, but his hopes for the reformation were uniformly disappointed. A few nights would elapse, and the same painted faces and mocking eyes he had pleaded with, and he thought, partially reformed, would present themselves to him under the gaslight and laugh at the handsome gutter preacher. Whether they had cried or fled frightened, or only laughed at his earnest exhortations, the result was the same. He was unable to reform them. He next made the acquaintance of a young lady who worked in a lace-making establishment. Finally he realized that he, the leader of the Shorn, had fallen in love. Then he tried to reconcile faith with passion, 
and besought Madeline to become of his sect, to renounce the world and live for the conversion of her fellow sinners. She might even become his wife, in a spiritual sense only, and live and work with him. She demurred, he coaxed, then he threatened, and carried his point. But no woman was ever won by threats. And half ashamed of his own violence, Nicholas kept away from Madeline for three days. He had never kissed her. Only a hand-clasp had sanctified the betrothal. The fourth day, he went to the apartment he engaged for her in the Rue Serrurier. The door was locked. When he had knocked violently, Madame Guida, half frightened, opened her own door and asked him what was the matter. I don't know. I, where is Madeline? was all he could stammer out. His face was frightfully distorted with a terrible presentment. Madeline went away, Madame Guida replied. The day you were last here, she said you and she had got a home of your own. Did she deceive me? Nicholas said nothing to this, but demanded that the apartment be opened. You see, went on Madame Guida, she removed only a part of her wardrobe. She said you would come and take the remainder away for her. Vasily fell into a chair and groaned. Leaping up like a madman, he forced open the little desk he had given Madeline, and ransacking his drawers, finally found what he had suspected, a note in Madeline's handwriting, addressed to himself. He stuffed her other letters into his pockets and sat down and read out to Madame Guida Madeline's last words, which made a fiend of him. I thank you a thousand times for all your kindness. I respect but cannot love you. I am grateful, but why should I sacrifice my life to my gratitude? That which brought us together separates us. You saved me, but you ought not to ask me as a reward. I cannot reconcile your roles of gutter preacher and lover. Forgive me and forget me. From that time on, Nicholas gave up his proselyting, and devoted his nights to a search for Madeline. His dagger in his bosom warmed his heart and promised him revenge for her scorn. The only woman he had ever loved could not betray him with impunity. After eight weeks he found her where he had first seen her, in the Rue Richelieu. Without a word he stabbed her in the back. She fell at his feet with a scream. He rushed off, mumbling, "'She is saved forever!' She is sure of heaven. She can sin no more now. Then the gutter preacher disappeared. The Parisian police looked for him in vain. A few days afterwards, a cocotte was found in a quiet street of Faubourg St. Germain, stabbed from behind, dead and mutilated. Three days later, another was found, wallowing in blood, with the same wounds, in the Quartier Mouftardne. Tremendous excitement followed the discovery. In a week, another was found hacked and slaughtered in the same way. Their money, purse, jewels, etc., were intact in all cases. A panic such as that now in Whitechapel followed among the fallen women of Paris. Nicholas, as he afterwards confessed, killed five of them in fourteen days. On the night of the arrondissement of the Pantheon, a dark figure crept up behind a young girl, stabbed her, and started to fly. As she fell, she turned and shrieked out, so that the police heard her. Nicholas Vasily! Then she died in Nicholas's arms, for he too had recognized her too late. He was seized, dragged to prison, and tried for murder. His lawyer got him a fifteen-year sentence on the ground of insanity. He confessed his murders to the jury, and told them of his mission on earth. He regretted that he had not killed Madeline when he first stabbed her, and when he left her, as he supposed, dying at his feet. The bloody monster was released from the asylum in Tiraspol on January 1, 1888. He was on his way to London when last seen in January. The Whitechapel murders began in April, 1888. Meanwhile, Jack the Ripper still lurks undiscovered. After the ninth murder, he sent out the following letter. Dear boss, it is no good for you to look for me in London, because I'm not there. Don't trouble yourself about me till I return, which will not be very long. I like the work too well to leave it long. 
Oh, that was such a jolly job, the last one. I had plenty of time to do it properly. <laughs> the next lot I mean to do with a vengeance, to cut off their heads and arms. You think it is a man with a black mustache. <laughs> when I have done another, you can catch me. So goodbye, dear boss, till I return. Yours, Jack the Ripper. If he were the creature of a romance on the stage, the one immortalized by Stevenson as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the murder of Whitechapel could not play his double game to more diabolical effect. End of chapter 2, part 2. Recording by Kirk Ziegler, Ogden, Utah. Voiceovers by Kirk.com. End of Chronicles of Crime and Criminals. Number 1. Published by Beaver Publishing Company.